So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Felicity Parnham. I'm a part of Charlton King's Parish Council. Uh, for those of you who may have not seen it, we've got the, um, it's just come out this week, is the annual review. It's the first time we've ever done it. It was a bit of a, yeah, <laughs> yeah a bit of a risk. But we felt that we had a lot to say to people who live in Charlton King's. So hopefully you will either get it through your letterbox or you pick up one today from here. So thank you. So this evening is very much about nature. Uh, we've still got one or two more people to come, but I just want to kind of move this along and we'll, we'll get started. Just to, um, to, to say, um, for those who've noticed, welcome to Jack. He's actually recording this. If anybody has any concerns, then please let, let me or Jack know at the end. But the focus will be on the panel, so just to let you know. Um, also, thank you for the questions that you've, you've popped over to here. So, um, in terms of housekeeping, for those of most of you who know, the toilet's that way, fire exit that way and that way, but not expecting anything, so let's hope not. So the plan for the evening, um, obviously I'll do some introductions, there's the questions, there'll be some refreshments uh, toward the end, and also a chance to have conversation with obviously other people in the room, but also again with our panellists if there's anything else you want to pick up on. Um, so, why are we here? What, what is this about? Why, why is this that we, we were fully booked tonight? Um, we've come here, and we've come here because of nature. And quite simply, I would think most people would agree that nature's in trouble. And uh, for all sorts of reasons, but in simple terms, nature is in trouble. And I was um, talking to, as it just happened this week, I was talking to two ladies from America, one who lived in Wisconsin and one who lived in Texas, and another lady who lives in Spain. And it was really interesting to hear their stories. The lady in Texas has been in shorts all winter. She said she can't believe it's never been as hot in Texas, in Houston, for them, in, you know, in all the time she's lived there. The lady in Wisconsin, they're knee deep in snow. And, she, and spring is late and they can't, they're really struggling to know how to deal with this. And I thought more worrying was the lady in Spain because she was then saying, it's May, it's too hot, it's unbearable, and we're cutting the fields because we can't, there's no water, there's no, nothing, the fields are dry, they're just, you know, it's just yellow. And it made me think, A, those are, there, you know, there was no reason, were, these were just stories they were telling us their normal daily life as they go around, you know. But also what struck me is how lucky we are. We walk out of that door and we see green, we see trees, we, you know, yes, we moan because it rains and we get in rather a lot of it. And I know I'm seeing on Facebook a lot about kind of box, you know, tree uh, caterpillar and all sorts of other things that are coming in. But actually, we've still got something here. And so people say to us, actually, well, we're a bit small and we can't do anything. But actually, maybe we have to realise that we can do something because we're still in a position to do something. And maybe what we do here we do for, for others as well who are no longer or may no longer be in a position to do a great deal. So that's a, that is a worrying thing. So I'm not trying to put this onto us, you know, it's happening, we, we just need to live with it, but also this is part of it. We've got four people here tonight who've all got varying degrees of, of, of time in nature and what they've been doing and uh, to your questions and to share their experience. So I hope you enjoy it and get the most from it. So I'm going to um, just introduce our panel, and it's, gosh, it's lofty. <laughs> and I, I'm going to embarrass John, because he knows what's coming, he knows what's coming. Because John is now an MBE. No, BEM. Oh, BEM, sorry, oh, I apologise. Right. Okay. No, I don't know where, somebody told me that, that's just awful. There you go. So, um, yes, a recent recipient in King Charles's first New Year's Honours, I believe, uh, for services to conservation and to the community in Charlton Kings. So, well done. Um, um, John supported the Woodland Trust at its line over wood reserve for over 30 years and was responsible for getting it notified as a site of special scientific interest and in securing its future. Um, John is a supporter of the butterfly conservation in Gloucestershire for many years as well, organising work parties to improve butterfly habitat on Ravensgate Common, as well as working with others to create a 20-year record of populations of the butterfly, 30-plus butterfly species. And actually, we've just been talking about some, you know, sightings you've just made in the last week, which are amazing to see, see. so uh, you can tell us a bit more about that later. So, Jen, hey, um, do you want to wave? There you go, Jen. <laughs> Jen found her passion for gardening and growing whilst volunteering on organic farms in New Zealand 
When she returned to England, she studied organic horticulture in Mould and worked on an organic market farm in Sale at Manchester. And she then started her own enterprise, an organic market garden near Pershaw. And in more recent years, her focus is her family and moved to Cheltenham. And you now work in garden maintenance, focusing on wildlife friendly approach. She loves growing veg and is passionate about enhancing our environment and has planted lots of trees and hedgerows in Cheltenham. So. Chant Kings. Oh, sorry, no. Charles. No, you don't do Charles. Just do Charles. <laughs> right, that's the second thing. We've got that sorted. That's it. So I hope we don't get anything wrong for you, Claudia. So this is Claudia McGregor. So Claudia developed a passion for developing edible green infrastructure in urban areas while studying at university, training in permaculture and travelling overseas. After living on a food farm in Portugal and visiting food forests around the world, she saw the potential of biodiversity restoration and regenerative agricultural practices. I had to get all that right. <laughs> Claudia is the winner of the Young Innovators Award by Innovate UK for the first ever floral seed shaker made entirely of edible flowers. Keen to launch a business that gives people solutions to ecosystem destruction and climate change, Claudia started Soil Snack. It provides easy to use portable and biodiverse seed shakers to help people restore the health and nutrients of their green spaces. And last not least, I'm sorry, apologies for this, I'm now going Joe Worthy Jones. Joe. Joe's worked as a community wildlife officer and nature in a nature and well-being manager at Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust, specialising in garden, gardening with wildlife in mind as a way of highlighting the importance of nature in urban areas for both people and wildlife. She now has her own business, Haven for Wildlife, and offers a wildlife gardening consultancy, walks, talks, and nature note notebooks, journaling classes for people of all ages and abilities. So thank you, Joe, for joining us. So you can see we've got a pretty strong panel here for those questions. And actually, so this may be a little bit strange, but we also see the final chair there. And I don't know if Helen wants to help us here. But basically, um, we've invited nature into the room as well. Because we, we talk about nature, but we don't bring nature. So there's our final panellist, <laughs> a silent panellist. But actually, you'll hear a third song. Okay, thank you. So, there you go. I'll leave it to our panellists to answer the questions. So, I have a pile of questions here, so thank you to everybody. Um, I'm going to start with a, um, one that uh, we, we sort of before, which was in quite simple terms. Where do I begin to create a nature-friendly garden? So, I don't know. Joe, do you want to give us a... Um, yes, it. thank you. Um, okay, where do you start? It's uh, really, it's a very difficult question to answer in the sense of how long is a piece of string. You're probably, your garden is probably pretty wildlife friendly to start with if you're not using any chemicals or um, any, any herbicides, anything like that in the garden. But the main thing to think about is what have you got there already? Have a look, make sure you check to see what's in your area as well, because there is... Quite often people want to change something completely to attract something that is actually um, not even around. So have a look at what you've got, have a look at what flowers. If you're, if you're doing, for example, no mow may, check to see what is coming up and then you can build from, from those kind of things. Um, I would say think about natural foods for, for wildlife. So instead of bird feeders, think about shrubs and, and trees and things that will give for pollinators early in the year and then berries for later in the year. Um, and then one of the best things you can do is to put water, have some kind of water source in your garden, whether it's a pond, a tub pond, a bird bath, anything like that. It can be a bee watering hole, anything like that. Make sure that there is a, a water source which is safe for anything to come in, so birds or mammals or anything that might want to come in and get that, um, get that water source. But the first thing to start with really is to make sure that you are considering wildlife all year round now. With climate change, we need to be supporting things like pollinators that are coming out of hibernation earlier. So think about your planting in autumn for the spring and anything that will flower in the winter, things like mahonias, I'm sure John can probably um, say better, a lot, a lot more or plants and things like that but anything that will flower as much of the year as possible you will be doing your bit for wildlife thank you okay. 
So there was something there, actually, if you don't mind. I'm going to move, move to it slightly sideways. You mentioned about ponds. Yes. And so, I don't know, um, Jen, do you, do you mm. know about ponds? Could you tell us how people could go around about sorting it in yeah, the sure. pond? Um, well, like Joe said, even if it's just a sink, really, as long as there's access in and out of the water... Um, and also think about uh, perimeter planting as well. So if you do decide to put a pond in with a slope, think about what you're going to put around the edge. So things like marsh marigolds and ragged robin, very good for pollinators. Um, oxygenating weeds and maybe consider a small pump just to get the water just moving a little bit so it doesn't stagnate. Um, yeah, but as, yeah, as, as natural as you can get it is, <coughs> is the best, mm. really. So even if it's just a, a shallow little puddle, that'll yeah. be a good place to start. Anybody else got any thoughts on ponds? Are you, John, are you...? Well, I'm lucky because I've got a brook ah. <laughs> <laughs> in, my, in my jungle. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I've got loads of um, garlic mustard, so mm-hmm. you can get orange tip butterflies. Mm. And uh, I've got a big old uh, rambler rose, which I don't cut and it's about 15 foot high, um, Paul's Himalayan musk. It's very thorny, so the cats don't like it, but the sparrows do. So, I think one thing yeah. to add, about, I think, about ponds is to make sure that what you buy, if you go to a garden centre to buy any plants, um, plants or get them online, make sure they are British native. There's a huge problem with things that escape into our watercourses and things that are non-native plants and um, trying to get rid of them is really difficult so that's really important and I think that you really do have to read the labels I would say Um, and even if it looks pretty and bright and everything else just double check it is a native plant please. (laughs) That's a really good point actually. I do have a question here about ponds so I will um, I'll just ask that because we're on this we have a pond, and over the past five years, our frog population has decreased. Mm-hmm. We have no frog spawn for four out of the five years. Our newt population is healthy, though. Could something have changed in our pond? So I don't know if anybody feels... Um, well, Joe and I were talking about this before, actually, and um, probably the predatory animals, so probably your newts, which is good, mm-hmm. because it um, means that we're getting a balance, doesn't it? So... Um, you know, newts are more in decline than frogs, so actually the fact that you've got more newts seems to be balancing itself out, so don't panic. <laughs> Let them be. You've got it's good. good. <laughs> they don't look as cute as frogs, <laughs> but they're very important. <laughs> Yeah, well, this almost like needs something on the tin, doesn't it, really? Because we, we have newts now, a lot of newts, and no frog spawn. So I thought, I resonated with that question. I thought, I like that one. So, yeah, so now I know. So, yeah, OK. So, what, so out of curiosity, what's the predator to the newt, then? Is it, is it the birds? Um, well, herons would get newts yeah. and, and frogs as well. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 if you've got a pond, you've probably got a heron that's uh, sussing it out. Oh, um, okay. And also, beetles, water beetles will predate on uh, the tadpole oh. and... Um, Frog's ball. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we hear a lot of things about soil health. So um, it, it's, it's become quite popular to talk about it. One time we wouldn't have mentioned it. But I don't know, Claudia, do you want to, do you, do you know, how important is soil health to us? To me, it's the most important thing because uh, everything starts and ends with the soil. Um, so at the moment, we are seeing massive amounts of soil depletion for from human activities, whether that's in agriculture or our gardening practices, and it's happened in a really short period of time. Um, There's about, you know, there's arguments about how accurate this is, and some say less and some say more, but there's around 60 harvests left before we've completely depleted our soil, Um, and that basically means that you can't grow anything. So I think, like, the the main things to focus on is try not to use anything that, like pesticides, like chemical pesticides, um, because not only will that kill whatever pest, it will also kill everything else. So it will kill all the beneficial living things in your soil, because soil is alive, or it should be alive. It's not that alive in some places now, but it should be sort of, you, we should be viewing it as a living thing. Um, and then things like fertilizers massively offset the balance and uh, also contribute to killing the soil as well. Um, and then we're not, we're, that's why we're not getting a, as many micronutrients in our soil. 
Um, so I think you have to eat something like 25 apples now if it's grown in sort of a traditional agricultural place um, compared to one apple about 100 years ago to get the same amount of iron uh, because uh, we're only putting potassium, phosphorus and nitrogen into our chemical fertilisers um, and then all of the micronutrients are getting depleted because we're not practicing sustainable farming methods and just relying, over relying on fertilizers. And those chemicals are being mined from different countries, so those resources will run out. Um, so when people say to me, as I'm really passionate about soil, oh, it's fine, you know, we're just going to make these sort of really big billion power towers with neon lights and feed it with the mist, and the way that that works is the, that mist contains chemical fertiliser. Um, it's quite cool. Uh, they have the mist at the same density that the roots can uptake the water as, um, but obviously all of those fertilisers are being mined and that food is therefore not very nutrient-rich, so we cannot fo- rely on that as like um, the solution to not helping and helping to solve the soil crisis. Mm. So basically, yeah, it needs a lot more attention than... I personally believe it's getting at the mm. moment. I don't think soil is very sexy as a con- concept. Mm. People don't love it. You know, oh, they think about getting under your fingernails and dirty, and they just like, oh, whatever. But actually, it, without it, we'd be quite screwed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. um, but there is, uh, I think, there's also something about here about the mixed messages we're getting. Because you know you, yes. you you watch on television. Oh, isn't it great that we can we can have these fantastic neon light, you know, and we'll be all okay. And actually, you say it's it's almost like everything's at a price. Yeah, I mean, we're over relying on solutions at the moment that uh, someone can put an IP on and then get loads of money for. And you're finding that. Uh, also with funding as well um i found like i got funding because i created a project that was novel that when i was saying oh i'm just really passionate about this and think we really need to be doing something it was kind of like tumbleweed when i was applying for things so people like these new novel ideas that can be marketed and can be bought Mm -hmm. and things like these big neon towers people spend a lot more money on than actually just doing something that nature does for us every day for free okay so tom I'd say the most important thing is get compost on your soil. Mm-hmm. Yes. A program Adding I did those. In the last couple of days said a minimum of 3% humus in the soil. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Recycling that back into the and soil. And keeping that in the soil, not digging it, otherwise it oxidizes all the humus and let the bacteria and fungi feed. Yeah. Feed the plants. You don't need to put any yeah. any yeah. fertilizer on it at all. If you have healthy soil. Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, I'm I'm sort of in two camps. You see, because I, I do gardening and I also do a little bit of work on a farm. And quite a lot of the modern, the younger farmers are, are more th- th- this receptive to these newer mm-hmm. concepts. You know, and. Um, because uh, I, I also keep bees, I've kept bees for a long time, and one of our speakers was um, a chap who has got over a thousand acres over the other side of Tewkesbury, and they it's all non-till, and they've got wildflower strips, and they're introducing, uh, they're cutting down on their pesticides, and they they don't put so much uh, organic inorganic stuff on, so it's it's they're trying to get away from it. So I think it's going to take a long time to get the word through. It will, um, and even in a gardening, um, you know, like Bob does um, no dig, and uh, a lot of people are going that way. I must admit I'm a bit stayed on that issue because I still like digging. <laughs> but, but I can see, and I, I do like, I do like that making compost and leaf mould. And, you know, there's such a lot of... Um, the microbes in soil and the uh, leaf mould is, is tremendous. Mm-hmm. So yes, I, I think we. It's the biggest problem is I think <coughs> nationally we're a lot of people are, are tuned to it. It's getting the rest of the world to come on board. Yeah. That's the biggest problem. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if you know. people are naturally attuned to it, to be honest with well, you. Well, we, we've got to keep <laughs> shouting then, haven't we? Yeah. yeah. Well, it makes soil sexy, as you said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good campaign. Yeah. <laughs> a big marketing campaign. To um, so yeah. we're, we're in the midst, of, for some people, of No Mo May. 
and, and then it'll be let it bloom June. So what are the benefits? We, we, you know, we're, we're going along through our estate and it, we, you know, we're seeing and we think, mm, they've not mowed their lawn or anything. So tell, tell us about the benefits. Is it, it is working. Is it? it Joe? do you want to say a um, Yeah, well, there's, there's loads and loads of benefits. Like I said right at the beginning, quite often um, people don't always realise exactly what is in their lawn anyway, um, particularly if they're in an older property. In newer properties, it's probably not going to be as rich, but in older properties, if you just let it grow, you may be surprised at what's in there already. Um, I think the other thing that people, we don't always think about, and I'm sure John can probably expand on this, is the fact that we like to see the butterflies, we like to see moths and things like that, but we forget the stage before that they need, which is, is majority of them feeding on grasses. So we have to allow those grasses to grow so that they can feed on them. Just because we don't see them, in because the, a lot of them feed in, uh, at, night, at night time, doesn't mean they're not there in the, in the sward. So there's all of those things that you can be doing to, um, to allow things to, to go through a life cycle, which at the moment we tend to just chop down. And I think that, you know, it's great that we're now expanding it on to June. Mm -hmm. One of the things I always, I always get a little bit twitchy about is when I see, or you see on social media and people say it needs cutting because it's untidy. Well, we all have our own version of what's untidy. Mm -hmm. Um, mine may be a lot le more than yours or, or whatever, um, but you know we need to get over that mm. kind of idea that things are untidy, um, and because what is tidy anyway? And we, you know, we traditionally with our striped lawns and things like that, which look beautiful, I must admit, but they're not doing biodiversity any good, and they're not doing the soil health any good, and there's all of these other things. So it, it's it's um, it's important to think about all of the other other creatures that are uh, are living. Somebody explained it to me in a, in a way which I thought was quite 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 good. If you imagine um, a sward like this cut was being cut by a, a lawnmower, then really that's like a bungalow. Yeah. So it's you know insects are going to be on one level on that. You let that grow a little bit. You've got you've got a two-story house. Let it grow a bit more. You've got almost like a flat, just flat. Do you see what I mean? It's that kind of. So things will be living at different at different stages. I do understand that. Uh, the other thing I would say with all of these things is that there has to be some maintenance there as well, mm. because you can't just let things go wild. So. When I worked at Wildlife Trust, I used to cringe when people say, I want to turn my lawn into a wildflower meadow, mm -hmm. because the work that it can take <laughs> is far more than they're prepared to do. So that's why I always used to say to people, let it grow, see what's there. You've probably got some, just some nice grasses in there. Enjoy it. Put a, a mow a path through so it looks like you mean it. Um, you know, it's meant to be. And, um, and then allow those, other, those things like butterflies and moths and stuff to, to live their life cycles. Thank you. So, Claudia, did you want to...? Um, does anyone want to hear about the history of why we have perfectly mown lawns? Yes. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I was quite shocked by this. I don't know if it will shock anyone else. But, um, so, we... When people had these sort of really big manor houses, and still when we were enslaving people, um, we, well, not we, but super rich people wanted to show how rich they were by not growing food on their land anymore. Like, oh, we have so much money, we can just buy all our food. And then they realised, so they put their lawns in, and then they wanted to show how many enslaved people they had by getting them to do menial tasks that had no, no real benefit, like trimming the lawn with scissors. Um, and then middle class people wanted to look richer than they were so they started doing it themselves and pretending that they were having other people doing it and kind of like self-regulating and this is where this whole idea of like oh a perfectly manicured lawn is like really it shows that you can yeah. be really rich and it's like this status and wealth thing but it all comes back yeah. to this quite like toxic yeah. thing um, and yeah just trying to dominate over people and dominate over nature um, um, so, yeah. Uh, well, I think it's a very British thing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, that we have a lawn with our beds around the outside. <laughs> yeah. 
And then, <laughs> right, well, so, then. Yeah. move on. They're, the front. They're not coming round to look at your lawns. You <laughs> can, I ju- can I just add one little thing, though, there? Though, if you've got quite, I've got a small garden and we do keep ours cut. But one of the benefits of us doing that is the fact that we've got mining bees which mm-hmm. prefer a shorter yeah. sward. Mm. So sometimes it's a mixture, it's a mosaic. Mm. Yeah. It doesn't have to be one or the other. So if you do like a, a mown lawn, it is not the end of the world. You're not, you know, you're not anti-wildlife or anything like that. There's lots of other things you can be doing. And the other little caveat to that is that people, different times of your life, your garden will be different, mm-hmm. used for different things. So if you've got children then it's going to be a playground and it's going to probably have a trampoline in these days and things like that. Then as you get older and, you know, you've got more time and you, you, you like spending, it's going to look a bit RHSE and everything else. And then as you get older again, you're probably going to go low maintenance. So, you know, there's different stages at different times. So I'm not saying you sh- everybody should let everything grow crazy. There can be that thing. But, and that's my excuse for not allowing my lawn, which is only teeny <laughs> tiny, because um, we've got mining bees. Well, I was just going to say that I do work in a, a formal garden once a week. It's a lovely Elizabethan garden in Charlton Kings. And the lady of the house doesn't like weeds, so mm-hmm. I'm usually on my hands and knees, and she does a lot of work as well. But this year, she's the top lawn, so we've got manicured lawns below and a um, lavender hedge with some wallflowers flaring at the moment. Then right at the end, up on the top, is a no mow lawn this year for the first time, so it's it's carpeted with daisies at the moment, Aww. and it's got this lovely lot of buttercups. So they from their conservatory they see this colour, instant colour, right in the in the yeah. right in their face at the moment. Uh, and then there's the odd bit of knapweed coming up, yeah. and, and there's one or two other, just but even um, oh, um, oh lots of common things we would call weeds, plantings yeah, and stuff yeah. like that, that's coming up as well. Oh, yeah. But the gentleman in the house, he likes, uh, because I think possibly his father was in the military and he likes straight lines. <laughs> <laughs> and so the lawn is, is straight lines. So there's, there's the two, but, yeah, <coughs> but the she's coming, yeah, there's the balance, yeah. but they are coming round to yeah. leaving things wild. And, that, and that's it, I think, that's what yeah. it is, isn't it? It's a gradual thing, and, yeah. and, and we know what life's like. Things become on trend, mm. and that's, yeah. Um, so I'm going to come to Jen now. And back to fruit and veg. So, you know, what should people consider to, in a wildlife-friendly garden? Um, and also, you know, kind of people don't want to lose their crop to wildlife, so how do we get that balance? No. Um, well, a bit tricky sometimes. Um, plant lots more <laughs> so that you well can afford. But you, you know, you should be planting a bit, a bit more so that you've got something to give away. Um, but anything like runner beans, broad beans, really, really good for pollinators. Don't usually get attacked by much once they're up and going. Um, fruit, anything flowering really, apples, cherries, and everything else. And if you want to protect it, maybe just. You can net a little bit of it. It's like the same, you know, you can do a little bit. So leave a bit and then, you know, just share about, really, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, there's lots of, lots of good stuff that you can plant. And um, loads of herbs that, you know, flowering at this time, like chives, things like that. Mm-hmm. Oregano has loads of butterflies on it. Um, so any of those lovely, yeah, angelica and fennels and things like that. Mm-hmm. So... Just, yeah, lots of different things. You just remind me, a neighbour of ours has put her front garden to uh, mm. to, to, to grow the front uh, fruit and veg, and I think that's mm. caused, uh, you know, over the last few years. But people take it quite normally now, that the yes. runner beans are in the front yeah. garden kind of thing. They do um, it in France all the time, don't yeah. they? They have just, yeah, fruit yeah. and veg in with flowers, and yeah. that's, you know, that's very good. It's good biodiversity. You're attracting beneficial insects and predatory insects to get all the green fly off and things like that, so... Can you expand on that? Because I think that's a really important point. I think it's the, the fact that you can have the two in with each other and actually there's benefit because yeah. one's sorting out the others in terms of... Uh, well, it's you know. companion planting and cover cropping as well. So you can grow a crop, say, of runner beans and then maybe underneath you can put you know, a clover down so you're feeding the soil with nitrogen from the, from the clover. Um, but if you're doing companion planting, so things like tagetes or you know, French marigolds in with your tomatoes, that might help keep your black fly off. And calendula everywhere will 
help to bring in um, predatory wasps and things. So they all predate on green fly and black fly. So just, I think, it's just creating a big, yeah, like a patchwork of, of lots of different varieties. So, so um, just talking again, just uh, continuing the theme of kind of green fly, black fly, um, slugs, etc. How do we deal with them without using chemicals? I don't know, John, have you... Well, because you can get these nematodes, but they're very expensive mm -hmm. and they're not that effective. Mm -hmm. I have used nematodes in the past for vine weevil, mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I, I think it um, just I, have lo lots of wildlife in yeah. there. So uh, put nest boxes up, get lots of uh, feeders to get the birds in, because mm -hmm. uh, like sparrows, yeah. I, I love sparrows <laughs> and starlings. <laughs> well, you look at um, sparrows, what this time of year, they'll, on roses, they'll go around and the, the parents will be picking off the aphids mm -hmm. and feeding to the young. Mm -hmm. um, and starlings, uh, oh, years, to, years ago, um, we used to get flocks of starlings mm -hmm. come down on the lawn mm -hmm. and they used to get the uh, cockchafers. That's and right, that. yeah. Yeah. And I have seen it in the last two or three years. Yeah. They are coming back, so that's good. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, so, and also with um, vegetables, if you leave things like parsnips to go to yes, seed yeah. uh, the following year, the the insects love them, yeah. uh, hoverflies and yeah. things like that. Mm. So yeah. don't or think, don't be too tidy on your vegetable exactly. crop. And I think don't be in a rush. Often we get the pests first. They're very very good at it, and they breed lots, and there's tons of them. And then you get the predators. So it's about just sort of standing back and just letting mm. that happen. And then eventually, you're, you know, you should get something beneficial into. The biggest, the it. easiest thing uh, to control um, a lot of garden pests is fairy liquid. Yes. Ah, yeah. 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 Soft soap. Soft soap. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 I just flick the thrips off. <laughs> <laughs> also, also <laughs> another way is um, getting ducks. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah, in some organic farms they just have ducks yes. flopping around. Mm -hmm. Some have chickens, but then they can dig up the soil quite a lot more and ruin what you've just planted, whereas <laughs> ducks are more tidy with their <laughs> slug eating. So. I think we, we, we also forget what larvae actually feed on aphids and a lot of pests. So, for example, it, you'll probably most people know about ladybird larvae eating. They actually eat more... Um, aphids than the, the adult does but there are hoverfly species that actually hunt aphids mm -hmm. there's also lacewing aphid um, larvae as well so the, there's lots of other things like you but you know like Jen said sometimes it's that initial oh my goodness it's all covered with it what am I going to do you've just got to be a little bit more patient but the finger and thumb method mm -hmm. is also is also quite good <laughs> um, you know okay you're killing them but you know, there's plenty of them to go around, <laughs> usually. <laughs> so somebody um, um, has asked the question, would the panel support Cheltenham becoming a pesticide-free pesticide town? And, and how do you have any ideas about how the council could manage without pesticides and herbicides? Mm -hmm. So... So I'm kind of part of this campaign already. Um, so a guy called Jeff that I met said that his dog had eaten some of the pesticides that had been sprayed in the public in Cheltenham and his dog's fur had started falling out and he'd been poisoned. Um, and the, the council don't put up signs where they have and haven't sprayed, uh, but you can only kind of see it for a few weeks because... You might have noticed, or you will notice now, that at the moment around bins and lampposts and trees, there's this like scorched brown earth, and that's from like a really high concentration of pesticides being put down. Um, so, and yeah, that's the exact sort of places that dogs then. Which is where they. So we've. I've, haven't been keeping up with the WhatsApp messages because there's a lot of them, a lot of very passionate people about this. Um, but we've, we're, we're going to start a campaign because the council are not accepting that it's glyphosate being sprayed, even though glyphosate, it, they're all under different names, but it's all the same chemical. Um, so, yeah, there's like a bit of a back and forth going on at the moment. But if you want to be involved, then please come mm. and speak to either... Rose. Do you accept it's glyphosate? Um, 
but they accept the manufacturer's statement that it's harmless. <laughs> I see. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm going to move us on from that. No, I know this is your question, Rose. So, I mean, it's, but I do, if anybody wants to talk to Rose or Claudia after mm -hmm. the meeting, you know, then please do. Um, only because I think this is quite an emotive subject, mm -hmm. really, and then people do get concerned about it. So, um, okay. Um, back to another question from. Uh, uh, how to f uh, how do I flatten the many big ant hills in the lawn? I don't want to kill the ants. So, John. Oh yeah. Well. Any <laughs> <laughs> <I, I was laughs> thoughts? <laughs> Is anybody else going to be thought? Well, of actually, the ants? Uh, flying ants. People uh, do a hoobly in, 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 when we get um, flying ants, but it's only nature's way of reproducing itself, mm. and so you get millions of flying ants. The seagulls go mad. Um, and so, just, and it's usually one species at a time, and they wait for when the weather's very thundery, in say July and August, and you see all these flying ants taking off, and then people go absolutely berserk, <laughs> uh, boiling water and chemicals are everywhere. But quite frankly, just let it do it. Um, and what happens is the the drones, they're males, they're up up in the air. The, they mate with the queens. The queens come down. They drop their wings and they start up a new ant's nest. But uh, at, but the well the thing is um, if you if you find old pasture land you'll find where well, we had when we used to have a lot of pasture land and it was flower rich. Mm. You had ant heaps mm. and they, they were quite they will get up this sort mm. of big yeah. and each year on your lawn you'll find you'll get ant populations which will. I mean, they're very industrious, mm -hmm. um, and you'll find that they'll, they'll excavate a lot of soil, mm. which you have to then level with yeah. a rake. But no, and, and of course they're a big food element for uh, all the other things. Mm -hmm. If you disturb an ant's nest, what happens? You get all the birds coming in up yeah. through the eggs and stuff. Mm. So no, I think I, you've got to live with them. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, right. Uh, this specimen, <laughs> um, it's um, a three-cornered garlic in uh, the garden. This is classified as an invasive species and a £5,000 fine if it spreads. How can I legally dispose of it? Claudia. So I wanted to do something about this. There's loads in a woodland in Chalvin, which I'm not going to name because I don't want the council to find out about it and spray glyphosate on it. Um, but um, basically, I was wondering if there was a way where we could like collect it all on a specific day um, and take it to the um, homelessness shelter and feed people with it by making a three-quarter leek soup because it's actually really delicious. Mm -hmm. Or just eating it ourselves. Um, but it does. There does need to be a way because it's it's mm. kind of it's, it's spreading. It's outcompeting the native plants. Um, but instead of seeing it as just a weed that you have to pull up and like put it in the bin or dispose of it, I would say just eat it because it's actually <laughs> super delicious. Um, and you can um, uh, you can ferment it. So so that's also really tasty, but quite strong. Um, or yeah, just you can eat it raw. You can put it in oil and put it in the freezer in ice cubes and use it as a flavouring. There's like loads and loads of different, you can dry it. So yeah, basically just find a way of using it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. Could you repeat what that was? Um, the three-cornered leek. What does it matter? So, um, I don't Are you allowed to let it out? Or? <laughs> 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 I'm not <laughs> Last scene opening up a package. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll move us on from that. Um, a question for you, John. Uh, what uh, drew you to conservation after growing plants? There you go. Well, because uh, my dad and mum were always into growing things, and um, his dad lived up at Ellen Woods um, before the war, and it was a thousand acre estate, and he grew up on it, and then he moved to John King's in the thirties when Miss Bub moved to Eastcourt. Mm. And he started off as a garden boy and then he was um, sort of thrown in at the deep end to grow things from seed and um, and then he, he got into gardening. And um, and, and so it basically, so, um, I think the natural world, I think, I think uh, people have, I think gardeners, you know, you get, you're, you're battling against nature all the time. Nature, 
you know, so you've got slugs to deal with, you've got a black fly, you've got all sorts, and then, and then the weather, I mean, that's bad enough. Um, so, so how I got into it, well, I think, I think it's, we all, I think I was really fortunate to be um, able to be shown this by my parents and, and people around. I mean, lots of uh, locals, um, they're, they're only too well in it. I mean, I, I started fly fishing in a field. Um, you'd think you would be fly fishing, getting off the subject, but in a, in a field. Well, that was to use how to do this, you know. Anyway, but that field is now built on, incidentally, some posh houses at Balcaras, but there we are. Um, but, you know, the, I think... Um, Charlton Kings has grown tremendously. I mean, I've lived here all my life, and at one time it was there were hamlets, and, and uh, then it got Bradford got developed, the beaches got developed, and then and then it's all basically all one bit. But the main thing is we have got green mm. pockets, so that's what we've got to work on. And I think you know, yeah, I, it's always been you know I kept bees for years. If you ever been through a colony of bees. Or you watch bumblebees pollinating, and, and, and you know how they. Um, if you go through a hive, and you put new foundation in, and you take it out, and you've got all those wonderful colours of all the pollens, all the different pollens those mm. bees have been in. So things like that, yeah. I, I think it's, and I think also the school. I think our schools were. Mm -hmm. We had a very good um, um, rural studies master who was very keen to get us into into. Because probably not being quite so bright as a lot of other people, we were sort of thrown in, you know, <laughs> in the deep end. Thank you for that. Um, so back to kind of gardens. Um, which garden centre plant should be avoided if we're trying to encourage wildlife? Uh, Joe is. Um, yeah. So, like I said earlier, um, think about all year round now. Um, one of the uh, bedding plants in particular are not very good for, uh, for pollinators and always go for, if you can, go for open-faced flowers. So, for example, the, the big blousy dahlias are absolutely beautiful, but we have lost the ability for that plant to give um, nectar and pollen or for the insects to be able to find that nectar and pollen by making them so big and blousy. Now, I'm not saying don't have them. My dad used to grow them. I, I love them. And there'll always be other things living in there. So it's depending on whether, you know, we're not just looking at pollinators. We're looking at lots of other things that, so bugs and beetles and things that will live within those flower heads. <coughs> but the, the double flowers of anything is less likely to be holding any nectar and pollen. And the bedding plants in particular are, because they've been bred to continue flowering, um, with very little maintenance, they've, lo they've virtually lost any pollen and nectar. You very rarely see things, um, things on them. So it's looking for open-faced flowers in different shapes and sizes. So you've got your composites, so your, your daisies, anything where it's got a nice open uh, um, flower, but also your tubular flowers for things that have got longer tongues. So different insects have different length tongues, different bees have different length tongues. So they can't all access pollen and, and nectar at the, on, and this exactly the same plants. So it's having a range of, of, of those kind of um, shapes and sizes and a continuation of flowering. Once a, once a bee, they have, they, they don't, um, they, it's not an innate knowledge of how to actually ac access the nectar and pollen. They have to learn how to do it. So um, that's why they're really good at, like, for, for, um, like Jen was saying, about runner beans and things like that. Those flowers, once they've kind of worked out how to get in there, they'll keep trying to go back to that kind of flower. So that's why you know, they're such good pollinators um, for things like that. So, so, th so the rule of thumb, as I say, is, is don't not have the double flowers if you like double petunias and things, but just make sure you've got a wide range of um, other, other shapes and sizes. So things like, you know, tubulars, so things like your foxgloves, penstemons, things like um, campanulas particularly are really good. Um, and then your, your open-faced flowers. And I'm, I'm trying to think of another shape. <laughs> rock rose, rock Pardon? roses, rock roses. Rock roses, yeah. again, very open. Uh, perennial geraniums mm -hmm. particularly because there's so many different varieties will go virtually every, anywhere depends what you've got but they will flower all the way through you'll find you'll see an awful lot of, um, of different types of bees and things in, in those so uh, you can have 
the things that you really like, but also make sure you've got a, a nice wide range of other stuff as well. One, again, and a slight caveat, um, the RHS have, been, have actually been um, criticised quite strongly by the conservation um, groups by the fact that they shove good for pollinators or mm. labels on everything. And it's not necessarily true. So it's worth actually doing a bit of research. And if you are interested, a really good book is this one, which is Plants for Bees. Um, because this tells you um, all the, which kind of bees. So it might be honeybees, it might be uh, solitary bees, it might be bumblebees, and it will tell you which ones they're, they're good for in here. gives you a really wide range and across, across um, um, a, a long board. You know, you, you, you can do it from the whole year. But, um, but don't always just think about bees as being your pollinators. Things like bugs, things are accidental pollinators as well. So, so you shouldn't dismiss something just because it's not good for a bee. It can actually be good for a beetle and things like that. So. And wasps as well. Yeah. Which ones? So you're saying that basically things like um, Lobelia and Elysium and, um, and pansies that we buy every summer, yeah. they're, because the way they're being bred, they're not great as pollinators? No. Pansies are a funny one, actually, because they come from the heart... They've been bred from the native heart seas, the little tiny pansies, which are, which are good for pollinators because they can... The way they're structured, they can get, they can get at the, the 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 pollen and nectar, and they actually have a lot of pollen and nectar. But because of the way that they've been bred, they're they're very flat mm. frontage, and it's really hard for the insect to actually land on them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so so they're they're not they're not um, very good. So you tend to find actually that they tend to get pollinated when you end up with your seed heads by bu bugs and beetles that will be crawling in and, in and out of them. A couple of good ones I would suggest are things like snapdragons, um, things like, um, I don't know whether you call it a bedding plant, but a cosmos is, mm. because they yeah. flower for such a long time. Um, the, um, I always say this wrong, Nemesia, Nemesia, Nemesia. Nemesia. Um, and then don't forget things like the, the Nicotiana, the tobacco plants, mm. because they're really good for uh, things that fly late at night, because they give off their scents later in the day, so they're good for moths and stuff like that. So there are a few good ones, but majority of them, like petunias and things like that, um, they just don't give much for wildlife. Pot marigolds. Pot marigolds. Pot marigolds. Yeah. yeah, not the not the double ones. No, no, the, or, or uh, single, the open single faced. ones. Yeah, 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 the single yeah. faced. Anything single faced is usually. Could I make a comment about, about sourcing your pollinating flowers? Mm -hmm. Because uh, neonicotinoids have been banned, except they're allowing them to go on sugar beet this year, I yes. think. Mm -hmm. But they aren't banned for growers. Mm -hmm. And so you can have a plant which says good for pollinators, but it's actually been grown with mm. neonicotinoids used as mm. a protection yeah. for the plant and the soil. Mm -hmm. And if you can source a local nursery mm. or even grow your own, mm -hmm. That, and there are nurseries which definitely don't use these, um, and it, it's, a, it's a bit unfortunate. But that's a really good point, Bob. And um, so that's why plant swaps and seed mm. swaps for local, you know, where you know that something has grown over two or three years, and there is research going on into how those plants grown from seeds that have been that have had that. Um, what you said, Nico's thingy 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 How that is affecting the insects, we don't really know, further down the line. So a it's, a really, it's a really good point. Known. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And they've used it as a spray mm. on, uh, um, what's it, on uh, Sh the sugar oil, oil plants. Oh, oh really? Really? Oh, really? Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. 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 And the manufacturer's own data shows that that is not biodegradable in the soil. Well, the so year after year after year, the amount goes up, mm. and most of it 
which is put on the seeds, actually gets in the soil, yeah. and the surrounding hedges and things like that are infected or have collected this stuff and it gets in their flowers and it, it's disastrous for it's the... It's honey, honeybees. Um, the it, the um, Butterfly Conservation and the uh, um, British um, Beekeepers Association have forced that, they said, you know, hey, uh, injurious these uh, neonicotinoids are mm. but the, the thing is it Bob, Bob's quite right that a plant that's been grown with and sprayed with neonicotinoids it was supposed to be the seed dressing was supposed to be the, the the new thing you see so they didn't have to use all these other chemicals the problem is that only about three percent is actually taken up by the plant the rest goes into the soil and then it, it actually works through the soil it builds up in hawthorn hedges then all your insects and moths and, and stuff they then get a, a little dose then the birds then feed off the insects yeah. so that yeah. is a decline in, in the bird species and, and then so that it, it's the persistence in the soil but then also the honeybees so when we harvest our honey there's a tiny bit of that in mm. the honey that we've already consumed. Mm. So, you know, we might be growing another ear one day or something. <laughs> we don't know because it's all new yeah. science. Yeah. Okay, um, Todd, you wanted to add something? Um, I'm quite passionate about the use of, like, not using or trying not to use as many hybrid plants or so anything with, like, H1 or something on the packet um, and trying to go for more heirloom varieties or open pollinated varieties. Um, and there's sort of a mass of different reasons for, for why I personally, from what I've learned, is I think that's better. Um, namely the fact that once you plant them, they can actually grow back year after year. Because if you've got hybrid varieties, their seeds are sterile. It's a bit like when you breed a horse and a zebra together. Um, they, but that horse, that zorse or whatever they call them, <laughs> that's actually sterile. It's the same with seeds. So um, yeah, having stuff that can, you know, can contribute to the ecosystem for more than just one year so you know if you move out or you don't want to touch your garden anymore you've still got those plants able to survive and also they can naturalize into your garden so depending on the soil that you have or the amount of sunlight you have and or the temperature um, the seeds that will survive will be the ones that are most sort of like uh, use great for your garden so over a number of years they will sort of adapt and change and you'll get ones that just grow really well and I think that's super beneficial at the moment when we need to be creating quite stable ecosystems so when we're starting to get more extreme temperatures we already have a garden in place that is quite strong because if you have trees or plants that have been there for quite a while and they're mature they're able to take more extreme temperatures and more extreme conditions than small seedlings so if we wait for another sort of five ten years and then go oh gosh that's actually it's super important we should plant loads of stuff it's going to be a lot more difficult to get your garden off the ground um, because I think we're going to reach 1.5 or 2 degrees by 2027 so it's not something like oh if maybe it's like oh climate change is happening and it's happening a lot faster than we realised and we need to be yeah putting in adaptation measures, measures now rather than in the future. So I'm, I'm enjoying listening to you I'm nowhere near your level of expertise I don't know about everybody else in here I'm sure you're all variations but this is quite difficult to grasp you know for somebody who doesn't I just have a garden and I dabble and I do bits and pieces so there's something for me of be as and you know it's just asking you is kind of when I say where do you start so I might be in the no mo may camp or I'm putting a pond together, but suddenly I'm kind of at the, the garden centre faced with, well, I'm going peat free and I'm doing this. But then there's all these other things that you've talked about and this seems quite big. And am I making the right decisions? So I don't know. I, I, I'm throwing it open to any of you who wants to answer that question is that this is your, what you're sharing with us is quite big and quite daunting. And actually, you know, I think most of us like to walk out of here with some confidence that we can actually do something. I think there's there's three things isn't there I mean and, and that's three things that humans need as well but it's <coughs> food shelter and water so that's all you've got to do you've just got to make sure that there's plenty of food so and that can be you know all sorts of things so you're looking at your trees hedgerows grasses um, open open plant pollination 
um, shelter, so don't clear up so much, leave the leaves, um, get some log piles in there, you know, just making it a bit messier. <laughs> and um, water, so like we said before about the ponds, it can be a little sink, it can be a bucket that's sunken down into the ground, or it can be, you know, a decent sized pond. But it's those three things, you know, that you want to be thinking about when you're starting off. Yeah. And that should then guide you to, you know, the decisions that you make. Thank you. That's really helpful because, as I say, I don't know, but I think that's quite a, a simple thing. As you yeah. say, it's what we need, yeah. so why wouldn't an insect yeah. need it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have a comment. Would it also be fair to suggest that if you're not, not sure about plants but you like pretty things in the garden, that you generally sort of avoid annuals in the garden centre because there are so many annuals that are overbred and that are not very helpful? If you go for a perennial, then you're more likely to stumble across things that are useful and that are going to then bed in for the longer term in your garden. Mm. I think, fair? yeah, I, th I would say it's probably stay away from the bedding. Yeah. Annuals, annuals you could grow from seed. They can be grown very easily on your windowsill. Just, you know, cosmos, cornflowers, phacelia, you can um, broadcast that on a bit of soil in your garden. So annuals, get some seeds. You know, as long as you're looking at those open things and, and they're beautiful and pretty and I love them. Um, but yeah, perennials, things like salvias and, you know, penstemons and anything like that. So yeah, you're going to get that year on year. Google is your friend. <laughs> yes, um, Google is helpful. <laughs> I have regularly, regularly Googled, does this flower self-seed? So if it self-seeds, even if it's an annual, if it's open-pollinated, so not a hybrid, and you've Googled, does X self-seed, um, that will mean that it will drop its seeds and then those seeds will grow back the next year anyway, even though it's an annual. Okay, thank We've you. We've also got um, we've got Charm Hemus garden as swaps and support group mm -hmm. in the area. Yeah. So if you want to know about things that particularly grow well in Charlton Kings, mm. there are loads of really experienced gardeners on there who answer questions all the time, so that's another option as well. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Anna. I think, yeah, I'm one of one of the um, because I work I worked when I worked for the Wildlife Trust and I did the wildlife gardening stuff mainly in urban areas. Um, it's a very different it's very hard for people to grow native wildflowers in a really urban area you, you know you and the best will in the world if you go to a garden center most of us go for what we like the look of mm -hmm. don't we so that, so there needs to be a liner shift you know we need to turn that liner in some ways to think about these things there has been a lot of research done into what they call natives and, and um, exotics and um, part of the problems with pure native British native flowers is they have a very short um, flowering span so the research they've done down at Wisley is actually they actually had metre square patches where they grew different plants um, and they then did the insect um, captures and all the rest of it on it um, and to, to show that actually exotics so exo by exotics they mean anything that is uh, not, not not natural to to North Europe, so anything basically south of uh, the equator, I, I guess, um, is is considered an exotic. So even things that are grown in America, for example, which an awful lot of our stuff, when you think about it, a lot of the things that we think of as native actually are not. Mm. They have been around for a long time, but they're not necessarily completely native. So it's a, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one to 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 um, to go to go over but the research that they did at Wisley w is online you can find out what their their decisions was uh, about these different things and what they were saying was if we want to support more insect life and more uh, pollinators over a longer period of time having exotics in your garden is absolutely fine because otherwise they're not going to be there's not going to be the food there so if you take for an example, at the moment, round where I live, we are absolutely surrounded by oilseed rape at the moment. Brilliant for pollinators. I know beekeepers don't particularly like it, do they, because it goes very solid Granulate. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you, it will be buzzing. But the problem with that is that once that's over, yeah. what is there mm. for those insects? There's nothing mm. else following on. And this is the part of the problem with agriculture and, and all of those monocultures that we have. So 
whilst it's great to go down the native route if you've got the right kind of soils, the right kind of aspects and, and things like that, if you've already got things there, having some exotics in your garden is not the end of the world. Um, I'm very much of a, when you're in an urban area, when you're in a, a natural gardens, you guys here with all of your gardens, if we were to do a, a, a visual map of Charlton Kings with your green spaces and your gardens, it would be bigger, you put them all together across the UK, they're bigger than all of, all of our, our um, national parks gardens are. So the connectivities, all of those different things that um, are important for us as people, but also for wildlife, is already there. So I'm, I'm probably rambling now, but um, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that please, I don't want people to get so hung up on the fact that it has to be this kind of plant and everything else. What will grow, because climate change is coming on, we will have to change what we grow anyway, because yeah. things will not survive. Can I just say yeah. about Charlton Kings in Bloom, going back probably 10 years ago, mm -hmm. we decided uh, to um, incorporate, have a go at, um, over the beaches, the left-hand side, mm -hmm. uh, we, we did two trial plots, and so we, we uh, stripped the turf off, and then we put a mixture of wild flower seeds, but they were non, mainly non-native. And the reason that was is because they were spectacular. So a lot of American species and South American species. And so it was brilliant for the two years. Mm. And then the weeds started coming in, like fat hen and, and red shank and, and lots of other things. So we, we then, uh, which Bob will tell you, we planted up a lot of native species and then we also did a patch on the Sirencester Road, but that was good for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then the weeds came in, so that's just been grassed over. But what we have done, and we've endeavoured with the area over there, which is uh, over a quarter of an acre. Um, so because of COVID, um, we, we planted a lot of uh, yellow <coughs> rattle, which suppressed the grass. And then we had a lot of uh, native plugs we put in and wildflower seeds mm -hmm. to encourage all our native insects, moths and what have you. Um, and it's working very well. Mm -hmm. But because of COVID, we weren't able... So the problem is um, our native wild, uh, limestone um, grassland species, they don't like um, it over rich. Mm -hmm. So y you can get a very... Um, an abundance of coarser grasses and the way to get over that is yellow gravel and taking the thatch off so yeah. because of covid there were at least probably three years when we didn't do any intervention mm -hmm. this last year well back in february we we hired two scarifiers and we cleared we scarified it we had a working party up there it did very well mm -hmm. and then within a week the cow sits were coming back up mm -hmm. and and that to encourage all our native stuff mm -hmm. But there was an area we didn't touch. But, uh, yeah, so all the, all the native species, because that's what our insects are used to. Mm -hmm. So in an, But the, there's nothing wrong in just having a small area and putting, uh, clearing it off and putting a bit of uh, the flower seeds from other countries. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not, it won't last forever, but it's in your eye. But the wild flower over there, it, it's good in parts. Mm -hmm. That's all yeah. I can say. It's not going to be... You're absolutely, Very spectacular. you're absolutely right. I worked with the um, biodiversity ranger at the time in Cheltenham, uh, Cheltenham Borough Council when they did the, in 2014, when they, they, they did the parks, when mm -hmm. they did the, if you remember, the, mm -hmm. the put in the planting, which they did uh, for the First World War. And the first year, absolutely fantastic, be be beautiful mm -hmm. colours, everybody loved it. Mm -hmm. Second year, they found then to get it back, they had to then... Um, glyphosate and reseed because of the, the, the stronger things coming through because the soil was that bit too that bit too rich. I think it come, comes down and now it's not it's nothing like it was at all and they are going down the perennial route. I think what I'm trying to say is I think there's that approach is brilliant in some places. What I'm trying to say to people that they don't get too hung up in their own gardens if yeah. you've got a small garden <coughs> about it being completely native yeah, that's fair um, but I think for what you're saying in a, an area like that that's absolutely mm. spot on yeah. it should be those kind of wild carrots but it'd probably take another things. 20 yeah. years yeah to get it right yeah and, oh and then there's or orchids come in you know because you've got to have the right fungi mm. for the right mm. species but they yeah. do come in very quickly mm. 
Yeah. I'm going to hold you there because we've got about three questions. Yeah. Sorry, very. Just quickly, that yellow rattle story. Mm -hmm. I've now got it clear from Monty Dong. I did not know we really researched for this soil, blah blah blah. I went and seen. Yeah. And they come through with them, so just to ask. But what was you know, really clear from him is you scarify and it's got to go in in the autumn. Yes, because it and needs to freeze and freeze in, yeah. it germinates. Yeah. And only then do you start putting in the other stuff. Yes, mm. yeah, but but you go around the hills up upon the limestone grassland, we've got an abundance around the Cotswolds, and you look at the yellow rattle coming up in, in the... We've got some wonderful world medals still around in Gloucestershire. As far as that, going back to that patch, which is hopefully developing as a wildflower area, that we certainly get it in the neck from a few people mm. who say, that's untidy, you want it to cut. I'm going to hold us there. I'm going to, I'm going to just wait. I'm watching the time. I don't. I think you eventually want to go home. <laughs> but I've got about three more questions, so that's okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Carol. Yeah. yeah um, just you mentioned cowslips. I love to see cowslips, and I've seen them quite a lot at uh, Rissington. And yeah, it's been a good year for cowslips. Mm -hmm. I have yeah. seen them round here. Am I missing them? Um, what well, you go up on uh, Presbury Hill? On uh, go up on um, oh Ashgrove. Farm, you go up there. Any old meadows? Yeah. We've got them up at uh, Old Dole, and it's, they're yellow at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just there's just a few more questions. Um, uh, I I want a few. Uh, I want the few daisies in my lawn to spread. Do I mow them when I cut the grass, or uh, or do I mow around them and let them go to seed? <laughs> Jen, go on. You're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> well. Don't know. Pat that. will uh, testify here. We mow around them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think. Yeah, mow just around them. if they look nice and they're, you know, and you, yeah, and you want more, just mow around. Reminds me a bit keep, the path you've just yeah, talked about. Yes, yeah, yeah, keep it. them. <laughs> Um, Herb Bennett is taking over the flower beds as my, mm. uh, my neighbour loves it. Mm. Good for beads, should I just leave it? But it's difficult to dig out. Well, uh, what you need is a sharp hoe and go underneath and, and you can get it. Herb Roberts also bad, mm. but not as invasive. But um, yeah, leave some of it, but it, it will take over. And also in a herbaceous border, you'll find that some of our native uh, well, uh, flowers, weeds, uh, you know, um, <laughs> They, they mimic, they look very much, you can spend all day weeding <laughs> and somebody will come and say, oh, you've missed that one, you've missed that <laughs> one there. So, yeah, they do, uh, but Herb Bennett always is a, th it is a thug, but it's easy to control. You just get a hoe and you go underneath the rosette and you, you've got to go deep enough and then it won't come again. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, difficulty cutting long grass when the lawn has been left for several weeks. So I think really somebody's looking for any advice on, on that. And we've done the no-mo, that's great, but we're now left with this lawn that's a bit this big. Any thoughts on... Well, get a tortoise. Size? Get a tortoise. <laughs> yeah. Right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so there you go. That's the, that's the thing. Is there any more um, questions? Uh, and then is there anybody that just... Yeah, um, I've got allotments. I've built up two uh, leaf mould uh, plants. With, with pallets, I've kept them open, um, and I read somewhere you should leave them for three years before you put them back on the soil. Is that correct? I think Secondly, they're longer. Is there Different. any particular leaves that you should put in a leaf clamp and then you shouldn't? Because um, I'm going to build another one this year, so I've got a three year rotation. Then with the soil in them, should I dig them in or should I leave them Let the worms pull them in. So that's the question is what you want to leave them. Not holly. Uh, mm. Holly can be a problem, also big horse chestnut and mm. sycamore, but if you've got a, a big enough heat, they'll gradually break down. But beech is brilliant, but you don't even, just some chicken wire put round, mm. uh, and it wants to be high enough because they'll blow out, but once they're damp and that, um, yeah, if you've got three piles, and the longer you leave it, the better it is. The longer you leave it, the better, yeah, for mm. sure. Um, great that you're doing that, it's amazing, it'll be really beneficial to the soil. Um, and. I personally would maybe try and do like a lasagna, have you heard of that? 
where you do the different layers of stuff and just try and include it in one of the layers and then as you say yeah let the let the wormies pull it down um yeah so we use it as like kind of mulch i suppose worms are an indicator because you're solid is that correct yeah yeah what for about sure using grass um, grass when it's not made <laughs> um to to mulch it yeah, yeah, for sure. I was speaking about this on Monday at the community garden in Sanford Park um, with someone, and uh, so the the cut grass attracts worms. So if you leave it on top, they'll smell it and they'll want to come and eat it. So it's really good. Yeah. You can take the nitrogen out of the soil if you put too much on, but if you want to weaken, uh, reduce the nitrogen, then just carry on doing it. Just one final question, which we have, we have not touched on at all, is, is like hedgehogs and foxes, but actually, particularly hedgehogs, helping them to move between gardens. I think Jolie particularly mentioned about the fact that if we put all our gardens together, the size of it, mm -hmm. but actually we, they aren't together, and there's lots of uh, people's drives and all sorts of other things, so how can we help hedgehogs? I don't know, I think Jo, Jen, I don't know. Um, well, yes, I mean, if, you've, if you know you've got hedgehogs in your area, it's talk to your neighbours and just see if, you, if you've got fences and things, then, then ask them to, if you can put a hole in. It only has to be c CD um, case size, about 13 centimetres, I think, um, for hedgehogs to move through. But I would suggest you get permit, you, you get agreement rather than just shoving holes in, in things. Um, <laughs> new builds are a bit of a problem because they tend to nowadays put those concrete bases. Um, but there are companies that actually incorporate a hedgehog hole but what you can do, and I'm sure there are people here, maybe even people here now, there's something called Hedgehog Street. So you can actually go online and Google um, your area to see where hedgehogs have been sighted, to see if they are around you. And in that case, then you can actually um, improve things like that. Hedgehogs, people think hedgehogs eat mainly worms. They don't. That's only a very small part of their diet is beetles actually that they eat the majority of so going back to soil health and everything else like that beetle banks something that's what you could do to <coughs> excuse me encourage um hedgehogs um around so it, it's it's making sure that you are not using pests all the things that we've said already um but hedgehog street definitely go and have a look i'm sure there'll be things on there from from um uh Charm kings already and you can become a hedgehog champion as well, if you sign up to them, um, and uh, that gives you lots of other tips as well of how to, um, you know, how to help them in your area. But it'd be really good as a group like you guys to actually, if you know you've got hedgehogs, even if you see a dead hedgehog, they do ask you to record that because that shows that they are in the area, um, and it goes on a, an interactive map so you can actually see where they've been seen. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so that's it for this evening. Um, um, I just say thank you for all your questions and I would just say thank you to the panel. They've really put them through their paces and they've done a sterling job. So thank you so much.